I feel like a rock star. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. So um, I'll tell you a little story. A couple of weeks ago, I was on a flight, and I came across this magazine cover in a popular German news magazine. Now, this, ladies and gentlemen, is what gender diversity can look like in 2019. <laughs> Eight white, middle-aged men, and one of them wears glasses. <laughs> That's what we're up against. Now, for those of you who are Davos regulars, you will have come across your fair share of all-male panels. The women here call them manals. <laughs> now, to be fair to Davos, it's not as bad as that magazine cover. There's about 20% of female participants uh, in the total now, which is twice as many as when I first started coming to Davos 15 years ago, showing my age. Um, but 20% in 2019, as one woman put it to me, who do they think they are? The Senate? <laughs> so for decades, girls have outperformed boys in schools. Women, more women graduate from universities than men. Women get more PhDs, but women are not getting the top jobs. And this raises the question, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to get more women into leadership positions quickly? Every woman in this room knows that this matters, because if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So tonight, we're going to hold a serious debate, an adversarial debate, an Oxford-style debate on the following motion, this house believes that in the Me Too era, the only way to close the gender leadership gap is with hard quotas and targets. I have six brave debaters, three for and three against, who will give us their views. I will then have, uh, we have four judges, we will start with Ngozi, who will sort of set the tone of the debate, and then we have three others who will sort of give their comments without declaring a winner, because you guys, are going to actually declare a winner. You're going to give us applause at the end, and the loudest applause will determine whether we should have quote us or whether we can do without. So I would like to ask Ngozi to sort of set the stage for this hopefully really exciting debate. Well, thank you, Catherine. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure and, and an honor to be here. And I'm really sad because this sounds like a lot of fun. And I have to leave you and go somewhere else. So I'm going to miss out. But at least I'm here at the beginning. I want to thank the New York Times, PNG, my wonderful colleagues at the B team. Hey, Hala. And <laughs> the Kite Global Advisors for, for having me here uh, today. So it's an honor to set the scene for this important debate, to discuss the value and efficacy of quotas as a means to advancing gender equality. Gender equality is one of the inequality, is one of the most pervasive and pernicious forms of inequality in the world. We are all well aware of the gender discipline disparities in politics and economics. Only 5% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women, and men are two to three times more likely to hold a senior management position, or senior management positions. You saw that uh, uh, magazine cover. This figure, believe it or not, has stagnated for nearly 30 years. The rate of progression of board diversity is glacial, and women of color are especially underrepresented in board leadership. Based on current estimates, it will take over 200 years or another six generations to close the gender gap. Clearly, we don't have the time. So the question is, how can we accelerate? What are we going to do about it? Are we going to do anything about it, guys? Yes. Are we going to leave here with some notion of action? Yes. Good, I'll be monitoring. I've taken the names of each and every one of you who came into this room, and I'm going to see you'll be challenged to do something very soon. In support of quotas, now let me say a word. I would like to point out that quotas result in more diverse leadership teams, and it's my strong belief, along with many others, that with increased diversity comes improved creativity and innovation, as well as better risk management and investment opportunities. But on the other hand, 
Quotas are not a fix-all solution for the deeply entrenched challenges of gender inequality. If you're someone like me who really believes in merit, 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 you'll find the issue of quotas very difficult. But if you're also someone like me who's lived a long 30-year experience in the professions, you begin to ask yourself, and in politics, how are we going to make it? Because no matter how merit-worthy, sometimes it just doesn't work. And I think I'm a living example of that. So quotas are not a fix-all for the deeply entrenched challenges. Individual and group bias are the incredible barriers that women and people of color face. But it's something that we need to think about because of the great challenges that we face in professions and in politics. You know, looking at this, thought to myself, um, in, in Nigeria, I live between Washington and Abuja, and some years ago, I established an opinion polling organization. And I said, I asked them. I hardly have anything to do with them, but once in a while, they come in useful. I asked them, I said, why don't you, you've been running a series of polls on Women's Day and, you know, uh, to see what Nigerians think and feel about uh, women over time. I said, could you run a quick poll on this issue? What do they feel about the representation of women in politics and the professions? And what do they think about quotas? Because I, I don't know. I had this feeling that in my country, Nigeria of origin, um, that people would be very much against quotas. So I, I just wanted to know. Sometimes you have a feeling, but until you check it, you don't know. So they ran a poll, which was completed on the 17th of um, January. And the results are astonishing to me. The poll shows that 67% of people polled acknowledge that women face discrimination in getting leadership positions in politics and the professions. But here's what is interesting. An astonishing 86% believe that quotas are needed to force progress. So this is the poll fresh off the, fresh off the press. And it's on their website. So that shows you, I'm very surprised. I'm not trying to bias the debate one way or the other. <laughs> I'm just sharing objective information, <laughs> setting the scene, you know. So um, let me now go and uh, just talk about some expectations for tonight's debate. You have an incredibly important and difficult task at hand both to discuss quotas whilst educating the audience, those who are debating, but also to tease out solutions for one of the most complex challenges that our world faces, that of gender inequality. I do hope that the audience comes away with a better understanding, not only of what is at stake if we do not fast track gender equality, but also the best way to ensure a more just and equal world for ourselves, our daughters, our granddaughters and the generations to come. I urge the debaters to move beyond simplistic arguments for or against into a discussion of concrete solutions for change, whether this involves whatever alternative means you, you come out of. Let's not leave here with a feel-good feeling that we've had a wonderful evening talking, but let each person jot down two concrete things that need to be done. In conclusion, let me emphasize the, the importance of, of a multifaceted approach to advancing gender equality and overcoming bias in corporate cultures, as well as the need for progressive, principled, and purpose-driven leaders who understand and honor the true value of diversity and inclusion. Let me leave you to these impressive panelists and jurists, and have fun. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Ngozi, that was great. Um, I'm gonna ask the first debating pair to take the stage now. So we at the New York Times, we care about gender diversity, um, which is why we're gonna give you a man. <laughs> Not just any man, arguing uh, the first case in favor of quotas. And Gary Barker, he runs an NGO, it's very interesting, he runs an NGO that deals with gender equality and what Gary calls positive masculinity. Um, Gary does, 
tries to break stereotypes. And usually, I think a lot of us, when we think about breaking gender stereotypes, we sort of envisage getting women into the army, getting women to the C-suite, basically proving that women can be leaders too. What Gary is doing is doing the other side of the coin in a way he's taking. He's saying that men can be caregivers too. Men can be fathers. Men can be midwives. Men can be nurses. Gary actually was a stay-at-home dad for a while when his wife was a main income earner for the family. I think you were doing your PhD at the same time, so that sounds actually pretty hectic. I don't think I could have done my PhD when I was on parental leave. Anyhow, Gary, you go first. You've got three minutes, and then we'll invite the second speaker. All right. Thank you. Going quickly. Um, gentlemen, and I am deliberately... Is this one? Yeah? I am deliberately talking to the gentleman in the room. Um, let's do some mansplaining. Um, <laughs> we... We've been sitting on a couple of millennia of something that we don't like to talk about, but it's called power and privilege. And we've been pretty good at hanging on to it. We've been damn good at hanging on to it. In fact, we know that WEF says that we've got 200 years, even with all we're doing in gender equality, to actually achieve it. Now, the other part of mansplaining, we should be able to look each other in the eye and say, that's a pretty abysmal. We, that was never okay, and we know today it's really... It, it wasn't then, it wasn't now, it, this is not okay. Quotas cut to the heart of it. Quotas say the elephant in the room is power and privilege. We can't do a few nice things, mentoring, a few men come along as champions, a few good men, and we think that's gonna overcome power and privilege. Quotas do it. The data shows again and again, they shift the norms, they get women into positions where they should be. We've been doing surveys with men in about 40 different countries, and when we ask questions similar to what we heard before, if we ask in general, men and women, are you, men, are you okay with gender equality? Do you think it's okay? About 80 to 90% say, yeah, vaguely it's good. Now, if we say, are you willing to accept quotas in your workplace so that we achieve equality for women? The numbers fall to about a third of men saying yes to that. Because we know this is where power lies. This is what it looks like. And giving up the chance that I might get a promotion or that I might have a seat at that table is no longer a given if we truly believe in equality. And it hurts, it can hurt, but there's nothing else that will get us there. Now the sweetener, and I've got one minute left to think about that part. Let me make it really fun for us men. So imagine a world that didn't have that magazine cover with eight white men. Um, anyway, yeah, you can look at me and you can figure that out too. <laughs> what if it looked like 50-50? in senates and workplaces and the C-suite and all of that, who's gonna be at home doing all the care work? Hey, maybe there's something else we need men to be doing 50% of. Um, and so while we're doing quotas, our team is also for mandatory and obligatory paternity leave that is equal to maternity leave. And the equality, hey, don't take my time away. Don't take my time away. I got 30 seconds here. It's a tough team. We had a pregnant woman on the other team. Come on. <laughs> this is tough. 30 seconds. So men. And what if I tell you at the end of that, you will have better lives? And we've asked this as well in a study with Dove Men Plus Care. When men and women feel they're supported in caregiving, they report their lives are happier. In every dimension we ask, their work life, their intimate partner life, yes, I did say better sex goes with that too, and overall in terms of their life trajectory. Thank you. Okay, I think that was a pretty compelling first pitch. But to sum it up, you know, if you want equality at work, you need equality at home. Now, over to the against team. I'm going to start with Judith. Um, you are at SAP right now in diversity and inclusion. You were at Google and Dropbox before, very heavily male-dominated tech companies. When you were a child, Judith, you told me you, you read science fiction, and the one thing that struck you is that there were never people who looked like you in those stories. There were no people of color, and there were no women in these science fiction novels that you loved reading, and so you made it a mission in your life to create a different future. And you think, or at least you're going to argue tonight, that that can happen without quotas. Take it away. Thank you very much. It's always good to start the evening being mansplained. <laughs>
So I want to take us back to first principles. And ultimately, if we want to think about the terms of this argument, it's really important to understand philosophically where we stand. So we could be Habesians and think about life in the state of nature as solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And in that case, we need regulation, we need quotas, we need firm laws to make sure that we regulate our behavior. And it seems that that is the position that the pro side has taken. <laughs> we on the against side, what we say is that we're more in line with Rousseau. We believe that the state of nature is an idyllic place where men and women are always empowered to be their best selves. And it is when you institute those laws, those rigid quotas, those rigid targets, that you actually create its opposite. That you put into the world the idea of the, of the negative aspect of the law, of the thing that you're trying to regulate. So let me give you some examples of some unintended consequences. So in the US, we have some supplier diversity programs, and companies will mandate a certain level of supplier diversity. And what will happen is companies will have a figurehead who elites when they actually have a majority company. They game the system. I've done a lot of work in Hollywood, and with the um, Writers Guild and the Directors Guild, they actually have a diversity intern. And what happens is that it becomes a ghettoization, and that when it's time to hire, they're like, oh no, I don't actually want to hire. We've got our quota, we've got our one woman, we've got our one brown person, we're good. So then we don't actually consider women fairly for all roles. Now, is that the kind of world that you want to live in, where women just get a quota piece? You get one role on the board, or two roles on the board. No, we want to have access to all the roles on the board. And look at the time. And the last unintended, I'll share a personal story. Um, I went to an elite institution, and I remember when I got into Harvard, I was really happy. And Jason Shern, I remember his name for 30 years. He sat next to me, and he said, you only got in because you were black. And he knew that there was affirmative action. And this is the guy that cheated on me in my math test. But he had the privilege that we gave him because we had this, this, or this expectation of a quota that he could say, I wasn't as good as. And I would say, as women, we can compete equally with everyone. And we need the opportunity. So we need to change the discourse and to change the structure so we can all compete. Oh my God, it is getting tense. <laughs> right. Yeah. Next, I give you Hala. Thomas Dott here. Now, Hala runs uh, the B team, which is a corporate social responsibility thing. But what I really <laughs> want to, uh, w w w sorry, no. That came out all wrong. That came out all wrong. What I really want you to take away about Hala is that she founded the first investment company in Iceland that had feminine values. And guess what? It was the only one that didn't go under in the economic meltdown. Thank you. 10 years ago, we experienced a global financial crisis that essentially broke not just our economies, but our social contract. I lived through this crisis in my home country, Iceland. And at the time, I was the executive chair and co-founder of an investment firm that had the vision to incorporate feminine values into finance. And yes, we were indeed the only mass asset manager to survive that meltdown. I went on the record then, and I will go on the record again tonight to say that too much testosterone caused a system failure in Iceland and beyond. Now here we are, 10 years later, and I will just tell you that I think sameness is dangerous. It brought my country off a cliff a decade ago, and while pretty much the whole world suffered dire consequences, it seems we haven't learned much or fixed much. We are facing a confluence of crises in this world and the world over, and business as usual is no longer an option. That's what the B team is about. 
We need bold ideas and brave action in leadership everywhere to solve the existential climate crisis, the growing crisis of inequalities, and the crisis of trust. I know no better way than through gender-balanced and diverse leadership. Not only do I believe gender balance and diversity will shift our values and ways to better serve humanity as well as our economy, I know it will. We have gone down this path in the Nordic area. In Iceland, we actually put on equal paternity and maternity leave nearly two decades ago, and it works. Iceland has for 10 years ranked number one in closing the gender equality gap. <laughs> Rated by the World Economic Forum. So how long are we going to measure uh, the fact that no one does well, but Iceland at least does best? We also instituted gender quota for the boardroom. We started after the financial crisis. Women were 12% of board directors at the time. And we put a voluntary quota on, and we doubled the number of women in the boardroom to 25%. But 25% isn't gender balance, is it? So we legislated in 2013, requiring 40% quota for either gender. That's gender balance. And it works because when we started, one third of male directors were for gender quota, two thirds against. And two thirds of female directors were for it, one third against. Only a few years in, majority of male leaders and nearly all female leaders in the boardroom believe it's been a great progress for all. When women and men sit around the key decision-making tables, everything becomes better. The definition of success becomes bigger. We are far mo more likely to deliver success for all stakeholders. That's the world we need to live in. And if we come out of Davos and our daughters need to ask us, Daddy, what did you do in Davos? And it was to go against gender balance. I was one of those who made the decision to let it take another 200 years. No, that's not good enough. I always feel quite inadequate as a feminist next to sort of these Icelandic women. You know, they, they outlawed selling pornography in 1869. You know, they had their first openly lesbian prime minister in 2008. Yes. They're way ahead of us. <laughs> so, team against is going to play the pregnancy card. <laughs> Avid. There's more to you than carrying the future generations literally into the room they're watching. You are the chief operating officer at Cobalt Music, which is the leading music and technology company built for artists and songwriters sort of as an alternative to the traditional music business. What struck me is that you're also on the board of directors of Barclay Retail Bank. So that, that is, again, not a place where that many women normally hang out. Take it away. So uh, I want to make it clear here, we are all for diversity. Nobody is debating the benefits of that. I think the flaw here in the motion today is that only, we can only rely on quotas and hard targets to close the gender leadership gap, especially in the Me Too era. era that's incorrect. Let me first demystify the supposed benefits of quotas alone. On the surface, results look good, and that's what our opposing team will tell you time and time again. But according to The Economist research, quotas have had no discernible beneficial effects on women at the lower levels of the corporate hierarchy. They're not helping. This is supported also by a study done in Norway, which is a quota country, where just 7% of the largest firms have female bosses. And in addition, in Germany, women make up just 6% of directors on management boards, and even worse, 60% of businesses have no senior women in management roles. This is from Grant Thornton data. So quotas are not helping women climb the career ladder. They simply aren't. They're not a silver bullet. And there can't be a silver bullet for something that's been engraved for hundreds of years in their norms and values of the way we behave. They may take some boxes, they may help women come to the table, but they actually don't move the needle enough. And so we must address the actual biases, the social norms and in entrenched behaviors that we have in order to close that gap. One great example of how this approach works is actually Eastern Europe. In Eastern Europe, 35% of senior roles are held by women. That number goes up to 45% in Russia. 
and that's compared to 24% globally. The reason for that is communism, is the norms and values in communism made that younger men and women saw women in leadership roles as something natural, viable, and not bizarre or um, uncommon. In addition, there are lots of um, help with maternity leave, as well as higher education in maths and engineering for women. So if we see that, if we know that's working, we need to think about what are the strategies, the concrete strategies that we need to take in our businesses as leaders to change this, not just quotas. It's not, you don't change mindset through numbers, you change it through actions. So let me highlight just three actions we can take. We must look at creating inclusive cultures of belonging and safety. Alone, we're powerful, but collectively, we have an impact. Leaders must bring collaboration and alignment across the organizations. It's good to bring, diversity is being invited to the party, but actually inclusion is being asked to dance and quotas invite women to the table, but they don't allow them to belong necessarily. We need to stop the microaggressions, the mansplaining. We need to, um, for example, uh, ideas, as a former venture capitalist, I know that ideas women bring to the table are far more scrutinized, whereas female engineers also are far more scrutinized in their code, 35% more. We can change that. And finally, we need to change the way we hire and retain talent. This is important. The processes we use, we have to be eliminate bias. So these are all actions we can take. They're not numbers. And I can tell you, numbers only don't change as much as actions do. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we've got the final speaker in favor of the motion, Rachel Kite, who is the um, representative of the UN Secretary General for Sustainable Development. She knows all about missing targets, climate change. Um, <laughs> I'm talking about the countries and the companies and climate targets, not Rachel's targets. Now, Rachel, Rachel is taking this debate incredibly seriously. She's actually got coaching ahead of time from her 13-year-old son who's a winning debater on his high school team. So make your son proud. Thank you very much. Um, our opponents, our honorable opponents tonight are suggesting that we can just take another 200 years tinker at the edges of the norms that we have today and that somehow we will arrive at this place. What we are arguing is that we can do this together with you if you vote for the motion in two years, not 200. We're not saying that targets, hard targets and quotas are a panacea. Of course, that's what the opponents would argue and have argued. We're saying that it is the necessary, if insufficient, step that must be taken now if we're going to have a breakthrough. As you have heard from my colleagues, we stand at a moment of unprecedented peril, of extraordinary opportunity, yet enormous threat. We stand at a moment of existential confusion and dis uh, discombobulation. And at that moment, ladies and gentlemen, don't you want to put your best team on the field? At that moment, at that moment, I don't want one person on a board. I don't want one woman on a board. I don't want one black lesbian woman on a board. I want three, four, five, because when 25% of the group is a minority, the majority immediately believe, this is psychologically proven, that the 25% are the majority. This isn't going to happen on its own. We also know from longitudinal studies that we take better and more balanced risk decisions when we have a diverse team making them. Can we afford, ladies and gentlemen, can we afford at this moment in our history to not put the most diverse, the most comprehensive in its assessment of risk and opportunity, and the most compelling group of people on that magazine cover to inspire my son, but also my daughter, so that they believe that they can do it? What we are arguing is if we want to change that picture now, not 200 years of gently sidling up to the debate about whether or not we can do this, but enforced action now. It was Alfred uh, Einstein, Albert Einstein even, his brother. <laughs> who said... <laughs> 
No, you're my time, my time, my time. A, a sensible, a, a brilliant man, a brilliant man who said that the definition of idiocy is to ask the same question of the same group of people and expect a different answer. Ladies and gentlemen, we need different answers. We need different lives. We need different inspiration. Please vote for the motion. Thank you. So for now, the applaudometer is quite even. Heather, can you swing the balance? Heather McGregor, you lead the Edinburgh Business School, the Graduate School of Business um, at Harriet Watt University, but you are also a founding member of the 30% Club in the UK, which is quite famous by now. Um, I used to read you when you were Mrs. Moneypenny in the FT. Anyone? Do you know Mrs. Money? Woo! So actually, I'm going to have you be Mrs. Moneypenny tonight and argue against quotas. Thank you. You know, it doesn't take 200 years to do this. It's only taken eight years for the 30% Club to take what was a campaign and not legislative change to take us from 12% to over 30% representation in the FTSE 100. And we have now covered the whole 250 and there are women on every single board now in that group. You do not need the law. If you want to change something legislatively, ladies and gentlemen, let me suggest to you that what you deal with, in particularly in the United States of America, which unfortunately is not as easy to deal with as, say, Iceland, so you're not dealing with something with a population the size of Doncaster, where <laughs> we, are, we are doing... With all due respect to my honourable opponent, it is much harder. There, in the United States, there are five, in the top 500 companies, there are only 30 companies with term limits. And one of those has a director's term limit of 30 years. That is not a term limit, okay? That is an excuse for men to stay on boards for years and years. If you want to legislate, you're legislating on the wrong thing. Can I tell you that what happens with quotas is it does three things that I don't like. First of all, it produces a lack of recognition for women. You have heard my colleague tonight tell you what that feels like okay it feels absolutely crap I sit on two public company boards I don't want to be the token person on that board and by the way the statistic academically is 30% that's why we actually campaigned for 30% right from the beginning it's at that point that things change the second thing it does is it induces the golden skirt suggestion which is everywhere that you've had this legislation you get because there's panic overnight panic about getting people on board so they put a small number of people on a lot of boards I can quote endless statistics to you about how overboarding leads to poor corporate governance. And finally, there is no enduring change of culture. You have heard also from my colleagues about the number, the paucity of the number of women in senior management positions in countries that have had quotas for years. So I would suggest to you, as a mother of three sons, to all mothers of sons, if you want to do something practical, don't introduce legislation quotas. Just stop doing their laundry at a very early age. <laughs> And, and, you know, I, I would also suggest to you, it was suggested by our honourable opponents in their first speech, that nothing else will make this happen. This is a very siloed, a very narrow suggestion. It will not change culture. What we have gone to in the United Kingdom and now in 30% clubs all over the world, we have gone from men asking us, a male chairman, of course, of which of the moment, at, back in 2010, it wasn't only Catherine doing things in 2010, that was the year that the 30% club was founded. And there are people in this room that were in that dozen who were with me and Helena Morrissey and everybody else, so people in this room now, and they have seen that change and it's a change in culture. Male chairmen now say to us, not, you know, why should I do this? But they say, how can we do it? That is the cultural change you need. It doesn't come with legislation. So we've heard some pretty meaty argument on each side. I'm going to ask the three judges to now come up and in turn provide three minutes of feedback. This will not be, they won't be judging winners or losers. They will simply give their impressions and their feedback. Then we will have each team choose one speaker out of their group to make the final closing argument, one and a half minutes. So listen to the comments, take them on board, decide who's going to be the final speaker, and then we go head to head in what's going to be a really exciting last fight, and then you have the last say. Milan, can I ask you to come up first? I would like you to take the first step at commenting, please. I want to congratulate the debaters on both sides. I think they did a fantastic job, and now it's up to the audience. 
Uh, but I want to point out a couple of things that I um, think are worth repeating and thinking about. Uh, one was Gary's point, and it started with Meredith talking about a column that um, Katrine had written about Sweden and parental leave uh, and men taking parental leave. But the extension of that is men have discovered the benefits of being part of gender balance, that they are, to use the words that Gary has often used in the past, co-beneficiaries. And I think we have to stop talking about this as a zero-sum game or seeing it as a zero-sum game and, and understanding that in the end, it is in the self-interest of men, it is in the self-interest of women, and we really need to understand that we all benefit uh, if we close the gender gap. So the point about um, men, I think, is one of uh, a very positive point instead of one of uh, attacking men, which is not in any of our interests. Um, the point about we're all for diversity, and I think we know that diversity makes a difference, it makes a difference in companies, it makes a difference uh, in governments, but there are many, many places, uh, and we've seen them over years, where the situation is intractable. I'm a firm believer of working uh, on biases, um, and a lot of those biases are deeply held and they're unconscious. Uh, but when you can really work at those biases in specific ways, uh, destroying the myths that Procter & Gamble has been involved in, for example, um, focusing on um, issues that not enough women in the pipeline can't find those talented women, so nothing changes. Women aren't ambitious. Really? Uh, you know, there's plenty of ambition, it's just that there isn't a le level playing field. And in fact, oftentimes with the quotas, you really do reach out and get a bigger pool that is rarely considered. Uh, and we realize there's lots of talent out there. Uh, so there's a plus in that. One of the things I was sorry not to hear today or tonight is a discussion about elective uh, quotas and what a difference it makes in parliament. You know, parliaments and other elective bodies decide so much that affects all of us uh, in a very significant way. It affects men and women, and very few women uh, have any opportunity to address the issues that are going to affect uh, women and their families. It is women in these situations who have often, even in the minority, had to struggle to persuade their brethren to put issues on the table. Uh, and I think that's why we see so many uh, quotas being adopted in these circumstances, not to last forever, but to, be, to last for a period of time and then be phased out so that there can be a real uh, uh, difference in opening those doors that are rarely opened because I get back to what Gary said at the beginning. It is about power and it is about privilege and there is something about wanting to keep that power and privilege despite the evidence-based case, uh, despite the diversity case, uh, despite everything we know that can make a difference. Thanks so much, Milan. I just want to add, actually, to this whole issue of political quotas. Um, I don't know how many of you here have read um, What Works by Iris Barnett. If you haven't, get your hands on it. It's really useful. It's basically a behavioral economics uh, manifesto on how to de-bias organizations, the argument being that you can't really organize people's minds very easily and that we all carry our unconscious biases. But there's one example in there about political quotas that I thought was fascinating in India, where they basically implemented these mayoral quotas where from village, one village to the next, some villages were just obliged to have a women mayor, just so that there would be some women in, in, in a particular state. And what the incredible consequence was, not only, of course, did you then have 50% mayors in that state, in various villages, but also, the enrollment rates in schools for girls went up because suddenly there was a root, there was a perspective for women. And I thought that was, a, for little girls, that was a really interesting example. Anyhow, I'm not trying to bias anything either, of course. Um, calling on the second judge, this is Carolyn uh, Tastach, you were group president for North America Procter & Gamble. Um, I actually saw one of your newly released ads today with Mark in the female quotient, and it touches on an issue that Heather mentioned. Um, you should all watch it. It's, uh, if you've seen the Gillette ad and you liked it, you'll love this. Share the load, 
It's about Ariel, exactly. It's, um, I, I actually buy Ariel, interestingly. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, and again, thank you to uh, each of the debaters. Uh, so my first comment uh, is that I want to go to the pro team. So I found it interesting that in this very rich discussion of quotas and targets, we've only focused on quotas and targets for women. And we all spend a lot of time talking about that, and we make a little bit of progress, but the progress has been, I think to most of us, largely insufficient. So I'm curious about what would happen if we started talking about targets for women and men. Now, I agree with Milan, it's not a zero-sum game. But frankly, we can all do the math. It's pretty easy. If we have a target for women, we have one for men. And what I'm mostly interested in is what would happen to the dialogue and the discussion in the room if we consistently over-delivered the male targets and under-delivered the female targets. I just think it changes the dialogue. And so I'm curious as to whether or not you considered that. Uh, a comment for the, the con team. One of the, one of the overarching issues, and Milan mentioned this, is affinity bias, right? We, we all suffer from the affinity bias, and, uh, and that leads to tremendous imbalance in many companies, especially at the tops of companies. So um, how do we deal with that, right? That whole notion that we can't reach progress because we get everything is perpetuated by the affinity bias and the le legacy leadership prototype that everything uh, is not everything, but largely, historically, we've been based on. And too often, leadership behaviors in women, and frankly, some men, the styles and the behaviors show up as less than, or they get labeled as less than or lacking, because they don't match this affinity bias. So I, I loved the comment that the inclusion is about getting people to the dance instead of to the party. And I think that's wonderful, but I'm, I'm missing the concrete steps to start the music. Um, to both sides, a couple of comments. Um, is there an opportunity for further discussion on talent planning? How do we get very intentional in talent planning? Whether it's a longer term window, it's 50-50 slates. How, how do, as, as Milan said, we, how do we debunk the myth that there aren't enough qualified women and broaden the sources that we look from? And then delighted that a number of people talked a little bit about equality-based policies. Gary, you focused on that with parenting leave because certainly we know that we need men to be equal partners at home and in the workplace. Um, and I wonder if you thought about the opportunity to both sides to reframe thinking about equality-based policies not as benefits. Benefits need a cost-benefit analysis, they, they need to be benchmarked, but how do we think about equality-based policies as employment practices? We all want to be the best in our employment practices and we want to be competitive in benefits. And would it change the conversation if we did that? So um, thank you to both of, both of the teams and uh, more to come. Wonderful, thank you very much. So last but not least, I'm gonna give the word, the floor to Vivian Hunt. You are managing partner at McKinsey. McKinsey has done, uh, the, for the UK and Ireland, you, McKinsey's done quite a lot of research and I think you might be sharing some of this research with us tonight. So I'm really curious to hear how you're gonna put all this debating into a sort of more empirical context. Thank you. Numbers, numbers, numbers. We all make decisions on numbers and evidence, but we also make it on our emotion, our experience, and our gut. And I think both sides had a little bit of both. Some evidence, some track record, some good examples, and also a whole lot of emotion to put the arguments together. <laughs> um, I want to make a, a, just a quick statement, and I'm willing to use 10 of my seconds to do this on behalf of the judges. You know, we were co-opted into this role because we thought we would get to decide something, and of course, we're going to put it out to a referendum. <laughs> Living in the UK, we've had a few of those recently, and so uh, I'm just not sure. But I will, uh, like my fellow judges, offer a perspective, not a judgment. Um, diversity matters. It matters to performance. Did either team really give us the why? All of us need an empirical as well as an emotional reason to change our behavior. And the data, my friend, whether you have quotas and targets or you don't, is on your side. And that is the case that here at Davos, businesses and organizations need to see first. Because then it's not an issue of the right thing to do, it's about being the most competitive and a leader in your field. Secondly, we've got to get granular. There is no one size fits all. And so what's right for P&G 
might be different for another consumer products and leading company. What's right for a pharmaceutical company might be different for an energy company. What's right in Zimbabwe might be different than Mexico or the US. We've got to get specific and tailored. If I told you you were going to raise all of your children the same way, with the same set of values and the same norms, you would just think that's crazy. The diversity of this room and diversity of our paths, mistakes we make and successes we have proves that we all make different choices. And so we've got to challenge ourselves to get more granular about it. It's not yes or no. Binary choices aren't real choices. And I challenge both teams to think more granularly and specifically about how to use data on your side and also how to use emotion. A couple of reflections for the four team. Quotas and targets do work. They do have pace, two years or 20 years, not 200. And they do hold up a mirror to society. And I do thank Gary and this team for recognizing that it is about total participation of the workforce, total participation of people. That said, the definition of parity is a little too narrow. It's parity at home. The reason why women are most often limited, particularly in fast growth economies, is because of the imbalance at home, not the imbalance at work. And so if we were to apply this both at work as well as domestically, in legislatures as well as companies, we could get there much faster. One size doesn't fit all. And for you guys, before you start feeling too comfortable over here on your high, <laughs> high step stools that were always designed by some man, you know, where you're sort of perching in a balance. I, I didn't wear a skirt tonight just for that reason. You've got a few good points. CEOs and leaders respond to informed judgment, debate, and nuance, not high risk target and rules. Targets and rules are always gamed. That's the nature of them. And we don't want to put, take an issue that is as substantive as important as our future economic growth because we can't grow without parity and leave it to a system that ultimately can be gamed. Narrow quantitative targets will leave women and women's participation in a narrow place and not actually moving towards parity. And finally, it's not just numbers. There's so many more levers to inclusion. It's our total lived experience at work, which is why very high performing organizations sometimes lose high talent women because it doesn't feel right. It's not just about the numbers in the room. It's actually about your experience on the job. And so in conclusion, we're here for more dialogue on big issues. But we also, coming back to Ngozi, want concrete ideas and actions to increase participation, to give all of you, leaders in your fields, confidence to move forward and have more women and girls participating in your programs and impact. I'd encourage you to think about that action orientation in your debate response. Broaden your definition of leadership. There's more than one model, and challenge leaders to use every lever available to them. Remember, you can make the changes if you make the arguments. And so the judging panel looks forward to your response. <laughs>
All right, the other side would have you believe that we are, we think it's gonna take 200 years and that there's only one way to do it if we wanna get around 200 years. Well, that's absolutely not true. And what we want to put in place is culture and organizational change. And the way that you do that is not with numbers or targets. It's you have a holistic and a comprehensive approach. Now, we've been talking about the fourth industrial revolution here at Davos. So we should lever the, leverage the power of artificial intelligence, machine learning to mine our data, to really understand what are the true competencies that we need to be successful, to use technology to have blind review so that we have no idea the gender or the background and that make, we make truly unbiased decisions. Uh, we also need to make sure that we don't have those unintended consequences, that every board seat should be a seat that is open to women. And one of the ways that we do that is that we, get, we have term limits, right? We get rid of the old boys network to say that we need a turnover, we need innovation. That gives us diversity, not only in terms of gender and background, but in terms of generation. We get new minds, we get new ways of looking at problems. We are absolutely con um, committed to inclusion and diversity. Where we disagree is having a narrow, simplistic way to get there, right? It's about, again, culture change, organizational change. It's about a larger view. It's about culture change. Absolutely agree with you. But while we've been sitting here in this debate, do you know what the Fortune headline is online? Do you know? It's that Davos is kidding itself. The Davos is tone deaf. Tone deaf because we won't seize this moment to fix this problem. So we believe that you have to start with the numbers, but then you have to make the numbers count. We believe that we are at a moment of transformation, that that transformation simply can't be managed just by relying on one small segment of society. You asked very good questions. You asked, are we too narrow? You asked whether or not there should be targets for men and for women. Well, in the Nordic area, where I would argue that it has been transformative to society, the norm is 40-40, either sex. You suggested that there were no evidence. Well, there's evidence. McKinsey, your own numbers argue that with greater balance, you would add as much as $28 trillion to the global GDP by 2025. So stare at that number and walk away from it if you're a CEO here at Davos. So we have the research. We have the evidence. We believe we have the numbers. The numbers need to be made to count. And I'd argue to vote for the resolution. Thank you. Right, we're gonna have a referendum. I'm gonna ask all those in the room who are convinced by the case against quotas to give a really big hand of applause. <laughs> and now I'm gonna ask everybody in the room <laughs> who was convinced by the case in favor of quotas, this team, to give a big hand. So I think, unlike the UK, we have a clear and definitive result. <laughs> there won't be deadlock. Of course, the only question is, if there is such support for quotas, and if this case has been so convincing... By the way, can I tell you a secret? Judas is in favor of quotas. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> so, if there's so much support, now we need some action, right? We owe that to Ngozi, at the very least. And this means we need to start, if we're policymakers, we need to start thinking about legislation. If we're CEOs, we might want to start lobbying. I mean, I, I constantly think of, of this one thing somebody told me once about gender policy. Um, they said, it's a little bit like the love life of an elephant. It all happens at a very high level. A lot of dust is raised. <laughs> And it takes years to see any result. <laughs> so, you know, we don't have those years. I think we've, we've made, we, that case has clearly been made. But I, I just want to thank these amazing women and this amazing man <laughs> for such 
an amazing event, if I may say so. I've come here for 15 years, and I don't think I've seen so much passion and such sort of clarity in taking positions, even if they're fake positions, <laughs> you know? I, I don't know if you agree, but I think in panels, sometimes you get away with waffling a little bit or taking a little bit, you know, this on the one, I don't on the other. Tonight, I think we've seen a really deep debate. We've seen a lot of arguments surface, and I think, if I speak hopefully for everybody here, we've learned a lot. So, let's change the world. <laughs> amazing. We have two more things to say. If you loved these amazing debaters, sit for two more minutes, because I have a couple of thank you. First of all, if you believe that the New York Times should be making its next television show with this woman, please give a round of applause. Woo! Now, I just want to call out the fact that until, as I understand, I got an email at 2 p.m., so I think three hours ago, Heather, two hours ago, Heather did not even know she was debating. Round of applause. Now, I just want to really fast tell you what I learned in this debate. Gary told us that the elephant in the room is power and privilege, and men, where's Gary? Gary, Gary, better lives, better sex. Judith told us, as women, we can effing compete equally with anyone. Halla said, too much testosterone caused system failure. <laughs> Abby was told by Katrin, you are carrying the future, don't fuck it up. I love that. <laughs> Rachel quoted the great Alfred Einstein in saying, can we afford in this moment in history to just gently sidle up to the debate and just make them do their goddamn laundry? Oh, wait a minute, no, that was Heather who said, you do not need the law, you just need to stop doing their effing laundry. So I want to say I agreed with every single one of those things, and thus I have held two competing ideas in my mind this entire time while functioning. That means this event was first-rate intelligence. So thank you so much. We have one more person. I'd like to bring my friend and our partner, Carolyn Tosta, back to the stage. I want to thank Mark and Carolyn and PNG. We wouldn't be here without you tonight, and over to you. Hey, just a couple of really, really quick comments. Thank you, Meredith and the New York Times team. This was such a fun event, a very novel, uh, emotional, and might I say noisy uh, format. <laughs> But it really did encourage everybody to see all sides, and I think that's so important because it leads to a much richer array of solutions. This is a topic we care deeply about at PNG: gender and intersectional equality, equality for all individuals, however they define themselves. And we know that to make meaningful progress and to create a world where we all see equal, we need to tackle bias, we need to spark conversations, dare I say debates, and change mindsets. And I believe that everybody has done that so brilliantly tonight. So thank you to all of the debaters. And thank you to my fellow jurists. Fabulous. So much fun to be part of that with you. Dialogue is so important. Discussion is important. Debate is important because we'll find the best solutions. Clearly, there's no one single answer. There is no one size fits all solution. But the fundamental change we have to make is fixing the behaviors, the system, the cultures that perpetuate bias in the workplace. We need a new playbook. We need a playbook that goes beyond targets and quotas only for women. Uh, thank you, Iceland. Uh, we need more than just sponsorship for women, more than just empowerment of, for women. These are all really important, but they are insufficient to the progress that we need to make. The new playbook must include men. Their work in advancing women, their development as inclusive, equally minded leaders and dancers. Uh, and, uh, and we need policies and cultural interventions that support men as equal partners at home and in the workplace. And we need a broader definition of leadership because it takes all kinds of us and the world's going to be a greater place because of that. So thank you again for the discussion today. Thank you to everyone who participated, again to New York Times. This was wonderful. The breadth, the caliber of leaders who came together for the discussion. 
If the Me Too movement taught us anything in 2018, it's that it will absolutely take all of us to make progress. And uh, I imagine, a hope, and, and expect that everyone in this room is going to join that, uh, join that mission. So thank you for joining us tonight. <laughs>